Amen. You may be seated. There's something that transpires when we begin saying that name, that name of Jesus. Amen. And I take great privilege of being able to speak to you here tonight and um, count it an honor to be able to speak to all of you. We're going to uh, transition into the part of the service where uh, I'm going to go into the word of the Lord. And uh, just before I do that, I have one. Oh, it's still here. Hallelujah. Did everybody bring the rock? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. That wasn't a requirement. I'll tell you what this is about in just a moment. Why don't we pray over the remainder part of the service that God would just have his hand upon it. God, we are so thankful, God, to get to call upon your name, Jesus. We have felt your presence all throughout the service. God, you've been stirring our hearts. Lord, we know that you want to do a work in our hearts and our lives to today, Jesus. So we just give everything to you, Lord. Have your way in us. Have your way in us, Lord. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah, Lord. We'll praise you for it. Jesus' name. Amen. If you'll allow me for a few moments here tonight, I'm going to speak on this topic. Neither do I. Neither do I. In John chapter 3, Jesus made a statement that we're familiar with. Many of us are familiar with. He said, For God so loved the world, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And those are wonderful words of love and hope as God expressed how he felt toward mankind. While we know that verse and find great inspiration in it, it is the lesser known verse that follows it that I want to draw your attention to. John chapter 3 verse 17, it says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And I think perhaps the truth of that verse isn't seen as clearly anywhere in the Bible as it is seen in the story that the Apostle John recorded in John chapter 8. John chapter 8, we are introduced to a woman who experienced the depths of God's love in such a way that she was changed instantly. Her life hung in the balance, condemnation and the death penalty hanging over her head in such a dramatic way. But Jesus offered the woman her only ray of hope. In John chapter 8, verse 1, it says, Jesus went on to the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came unto him. And he sat down and taught them, and the scribes and Pharisees brought unto him a woman taken in adultery. And when they had set her in the midst, they say unto him, Master, this woman was taken in adultery in the very act. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what sayest thou? What sayest thou? This they said, tempting him, that they might come to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and with his finger wrote on the ground, as though he heard them not. And so when they continued asking him, he lifted up himself and said unto them, He that is without sin among you, let him first cast a stone at her. And again he stooped down and wrote on the ground. And they which heard it, being convicted by their own conscience, went out one by one, beginning at the eldest, even unto the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had lifted up himself and saw none but the woman, he said unto her, Woman, where are those thine accusers? Hath no man condemned thee? She said, No man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, Neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. The story that it's unfolding here tonight before us, I want you to allow yourself to imagine traveling back to this time so that you are standing there with her and Jesus. Put yourself in her shoes and watch as the story unfolds. Here tonight, Jesus has come into the temple early one morning. And as you can see in verse 2, there was a great crowd gathered around him. I can picture Jesus sitting on steps or sitting on a stone with the people sitting around his feet circled around him so that they can get a better view and as he was teaching the scribes and pharisees came up to him with this woman 
The scribes were a group of, or society of men who spent their days making copies of the Old Testament, copying and recopying, learning and memorizing it, and eventually becoming teachers of it. They prided themselves on being, uh, on being uh, scholars of the Word, and they knew the Old Testament front to back. Like the Pharisees who have come with them, and of course we have met the Pharisees before, we've heard about them before. This group of religious leaders was out to destroy Jesus. Now, we don't know much about this woman other than that he, she had been caught in the very act of adultery. That's the only thing that the Bible really records about her. We can imagine the raw shame and embarrassment that she must have felt as these men paraded her around for all to see, calling out what she had done, dragging her through the crowd towards Jesus. Put yourself in her shoes today. Suppose you've had a long struggle with some form of sin, perhaps even a sin that no one knows about. If you need help imagining what this would be like, just imagine how you would feel if you were brought up right here on this platform in front of the entire church and your sin was, was brought aloud to everybody in the congregation to hear. Everyone was told about how you had been caught in the very act of sin. Imagine the shame and the guilt that you would feel in front of your peers. And as she stands there listening and waiting, all eyes in the crowd are glued on her. The scribes and Pharisees ask Jesus what ought to be done to her. And verse 6 tells us that they were trying to trap Jesus. You see, the penalty under the law for this crime was to be stoned to death. The law told them that adultery is sin, and it was a crime both against man and God. It was a capital offense. So God's law said to stone to death anyone guilty of it. Should we stone her, they asked Jesus. They had been wondering all this time what he would do. If Jesus says yes, then he loses the support of the people. If Jesus says no, then he openly denies the authority of God's law. And since Jesus is God, he cannot deny his own law. So what will he do? I can just sense the smug looks on the faces of those men that thought that they had trapped Jesus. Oh, we've got him this time. There's no way he can squirm out of this one. We've got him. But then he does something peculiar. Has anybody ever experienced what Pastor talked about this morning? God doing things that sometimes you just don't make sense. Putting you into situations that you don't know how it's going to end up. It just doesn't make sense. And he gets down on the dirt and ignores the men and begins writing and drawing something in the dirt. They kept pressing him for an answer. Yes or no, Jesus? Do we stone her according to the law of Moses or not? And Jesus, he finally gets up and says to them, let him that has no sin cast the first stone. Then he got down and rode in the dirt again. And all these men are standing there still with the stones in their hands. And in that moment, realizing their own sins in that moment realizing that they too were sinners one by one the stones fall and across that floor of that ground where they were standing that day littered the ground with these stones a memorial all around this adulterous woman that had been caught caught in the very act a memorial to her that she was not the only one that day who had sinned She looked around and seen, as we see in the story, Jesus asks her, where are your accusers? Did any of them condemn you? Were they able to condemn you? He said, Jesus, as he asks his question, she looks at him, and I imagine with tears running down her face, and says, no man, Lord. You have to realize she was this close to death. She was this close, staring down a brutal death. She knew what the law said. She knew what that meant for her. But she did not realize what that would mean for her when she was before Jesus. 
Jesus' response voided the condemnation from the crowd. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Neither do I. Greater words were never spoken so powerful and yet so calm. Neither do I. What an awesome encounter. Here's a woman whose life is literally on the line. She encounters Christ and is able to walk away free. Of course, there are questions we have about this story that come up. Where's the man who was with her? Why wasn't he there being stoned? Where were these men just waiting in the room? What was Jesus writing in the dirt? Some scholars believe that his act of writing in the dust was in correlation to Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 13. It says, Lord, you are the hope of Israel. All who forsake you will be put to shame. Those who turn away from you will be written in the dust because they have forsaken the Lord, the spring of living water. Just in the verse Just in the chapter previous to this one, in John chapter 7, Jesus revealed that he was the living water. And it was these Pharisees, these leaders that denied it. They walked away from it. And still to this this chapter, in John chapter 8, they're trying to pin him. They're trying to change what's going on. Those are all good questions, but they are irrelevant tonight. What matters is that you recognize yourself in this story, in this woman's life, and learn the lessons that God has for us. The law called for her death, and there wasn't anything that she could do about it. That was it. Listen to Leviticus chapter 20. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. If that's not clear enough for you, Deuteronomy chapter 22, verse 22 says, If a man be found lying with a woman married to an husband, then they shall both of them die, both the man that lay with the woman and the woman, so shalt thou put away evil from Israel. They knew what these verses said, and here they come trying to trap Jesus, the living word, with the law. According to the law, this woman deserved to die because of her adultery, because of her crime, her sin against God. Are we any different? The Bible tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. Pastor said last week, I believe, he said, you don't get good to get God, you get God to get good. It's an old saying that's been around for a while. You don't wait until you're good enough To be able to receive God in your life, you get God and he makes you good. There's no question about our guilt. We were born in sin and we commit sin on a frequent basis. Hopefully I'm not alone in that. I'm just kind of putting myself out on a limb. (laughs) I don't know about you, but I'm human. I fail. I mess up. I make mistakes. Paul said that the whole world is guilty before God. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 8, the Apostle John said, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. We make God a liar and his word is not in us. Now, there aren't any scribes and Pharisees in your life today. Thank the Lord. But you have an adversary, the devil, Satan, And he spends his days looking at your life, lying in wait, just like those men did. And every time he catches you in the act of sin, he drags you into the presence of Jesus and exposes your guilt. We stand guilty before God, and there's nothing that we can say to our defense. We're sinners. Romans chapter 6, verse 23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but... Oh, I love this. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. What is that gift that he was talking about in this chapter? That is salvation. Remember what those men said. She deserves to to die. She broke the law. What do you say, Jesus? What do you say? Hopeless and helpless, we come before Christ. Nothing in our life can be hid from him. We are completely exposed but every time someone encounters jesus it is an encounter of grace the woman deserved death but she got life 
She deserved to be condemned, but she was set free. She hadn't done anything to deserve pardon. That's why we call it grace. That's why we call it grace. Those Pharisees and Sadducees. In Bible school, they used to say, that's why they call them Sadducees, because they're Sadducee. (laughs) I know, it's corny, it's terrible. (laughs) But I I, I picture this story in somewhat of a a theoretical sense, I guess. Uh, uh, Imagine what what would take place as these men dragged her out into the streets. Her life completely exposed. Everything that she had done exposed before everyone. And the Pharisees are basically out there selling rocks to everybody that'll take one. Rock for 25 cents? 25 cents? Anybody? Anybody that'll take one? Grab one? We're about to kill her. And as... Seen in this picture, here she is, completely vulnerable before her Savior. Completely vulnerable before the only one that could save her. If they, if they could have brought her anywhere that day, they brought her to the right place. Little did they know what they thought was going to trap her. And not only kill her, but dethrone Christ. Only spared her life. What is grace? Grace is getting something that you don't deserve. In the story in John chapter 8, Jesus pardoned the woman and she walks away forgiven and free. But what about you tonight? The stones that were held in the hands of her accusers fell to the ground in the presence of the rock of ages. The stones of accusation, the stones of condemnation, the stones, you know, those looks. They fell to the ground when they encountered the rock of ages. Grace is a funny thing. Grace is you getting something that you don't deserve. But God doesn't force it on you. You have to accept it. It's a gift. We have to accept what Jesus did for us. And I find in many cases people get hung up right here. It's not accepted because we don't think we deserve it. That's the funny thing about grace is that we don't. He pardons us when we have no pardon. He takes our offenses when we ourselves cannot take those offenses away. We can't get past the fact that we haven't earned it or we haven't done anything worthy to receive His grace, and so we just, we just don't accept it. The writer of Hebrews told us that Jesus ever lives to make intercession for you. Do you realize what that means? It means that even in your state of being saved from hell, the only hope and help you have is your attorney, Jesus Christ, who stands before the throne of God pleading on your behalf. And when it's our turn to approach the bench, Jesus asks where our accusers are. But seeing no one around, Jesus proclaims over our life, neither do I. Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I hold your sin over your head. Neither do I. She said, no man, Lord. And Jesus said unto her, neither do I condemn thee. Go and sin no more. What's he saying? Don't go back. I forgive you. You've got a new lease on life. And though my sin is different and your sin may be different than the woman in this story, Our accuser has drug us each time we failed before God and exposed our sin. We have stood guilty before a holy God. We and he didn't write in the dirt for each of us, but we get to see where he has written in his word that he loves us and that he died for us and that he lives forevermore, our Savior. Your life changes when you realize that Jesus isn't here to condemn you, but rather to set you free. Just a few verses later, Jesus says this. Verse, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. That's in that chapter. Just a few verses later, and when Jesus said, let him that has no sin cast the first stone, he was the only one who qualified to have a stone in his hand ready to throw. And yet, instead, he extends mercy and grace. 
And though we may have people around us who accuse us and drag us in front of Jesus saying, we find them guilty, don't you? We have a loving God to cover us with his grace. Jesus isn't condoning sin in this story, but rather he is extending mercy and forgiveness. And he tells the woman to go and sin no more. And he is extending that same forgiveness and mercy to each and every one of us. A warning of caution to us as Christians is for us to be careful not to be the stone throwers. Warning for us as Christians is to be careful not to be the accusers of our own brothers and sisters. It's easy to pick out faults in others. It's easy to look at somebody else and say, oh, that's, that's a fault right there. But God's word reminds us that such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You were justified. You have experienced His grace and mercy. And our job is not to cast judgment, but to lead them to the cross that is higher than us. If I could have the music come back. To anyone here or listening to the service tonight, I want you to know that you don't have to worry about what the devil or people have said about you. Jesus has covered you with his own blood. He has sheltered you from attack. As pastor preached two Sundays ago, Jesus has become shame for us, so we no longer have to live under the shadow of guilt and shame. Has anyone been able to condemn you? Neither do I. Neither do I. Too many people are, are afraid of walking back into a church that they've left because they are afraid of the condemnation that they will receive. But God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And he did not commission us with his gospel to condemn people, but rather to show his love that supersedes the law. Maybe you feel like your life has been wrecked and ruined and you are living with condemnation and guilt. Maybe you have been hurt by judgmental people and live afraid of being condemned again. And maybe tonight... You were looking for a compassionate Savior to speak over you. Neither do I condemn you. Really, there is something in this story for each of us. We could all stand. I read the story just a few weeks ago about true story. A man found out that his neighbor was behind on her rent and he went and talked to a few of his friends and he said, let's let's pitch in some money together. And we'll, we'll pay her rent. So they got together some money. And what ends up being was a greater blessing than they, what they first thought. They were just planning on paying for that month. But they came up with enough money to pay for that month and two more months. And the guy takes the money and he goes to her door and he knocks on the door. Knocks on her door and... Nobody answers. He knocks again. Nobody answers. So finally, after multiple attempts, he leaves. He leaves, and a few days later, he sees her downtown. Sees her downtown, and he said, My goodness, I was trying to find you. I told my friends about your situation. We put together some money. We want to help you. We've got enough money for three months' rent here. And uh, he said, I, I knocked on your door, but nobody answered. And she, she was completely surprised, she gasped. And she said, I thought you were the landlord coming to evict me. How many times have we been afraid to answer the door from God, knocking on our heart? Because we're afraid that he's going to punish us. We're afraid that he's going to evict us. We're afraid that he's going to bring the hammer down when he finds out that we too are guilty. If you take nothing away from this tonight other than this, know that God is not out to punish you. God is not out to evict you. He's not out to kick you out into the cold and condemning world. God is out to save you, to forgive you, to cleanse you. And when we find ourselves accused, God speaks into our shame and guilt, simple words of grace. Neither do I condemn you. 
This is a jaw-dropping experience to the devil to drug you before his feet. But, but haven't, haven't you seen what they've done? Didn't you know what they've been involved in? But God, in his grace, he simply says, no, no, I don't anymore. Do you see anything to condemn you? Neither do I. In the face of guilt, condemnation, and judgment, Jesus speaks words of grace and transformation. My prayer tonight for each of us is that we may hear those words for ourselves and that we may speak those words for others. Neither do I. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was in darkness, but the Lord was a light unto me. You see, He turns ashes into beauty. He turns mourning into joy. He turns darkness into light. That's the God that we serve. We don't have to live under condemnation. We can simply come to Jesus. He's not waiting there with a stone to cast judgment. Rather, He's got grace grace amen i'm going to open up this altar as we come you can come social distance as we sing this song hallelujah jesus